Hello and welcome to this Nuffield Research Placement student webinar. This webinar series has been designed to complement your research placement by sharing real stories from STEM professionals and ambassadors. Over the course of this webinar series, our range of speakers will provide expert advice and guidance on future career opportunities and pathways that are open to you as a STEM student. By sharing bite-sized insights into the varied world of STEM careers, we hope that you will come away understanding more about the exciting ways in which you can apply your STEM education. Each webinar in this series features approximately 15 minutes of presentation from our guest speaker, followed by a question and answer session. In this webinar, we're going to hear from Dr. Mobiodo Yakonsolu. Mo is a senior lecturer at Wrexham Glinda University, and they will be speaking to you about their experience as a researcher and electrical engineer. With that, I'd like to welcome and hand over to Mo. Uh, thank you very much, Josh. Um, as, as just rightly said, I'm currently a senior lecturer at Wrexham Glinda University in electronic and communication engineering to be precise and I'll be sharing very briefly of course my STEM journey as an engineer with you today. Next slide please. Um, a, a bit a bit about myself. I was born in Nigeria over 30 years ago. I'm a Christian by faith and my tribe in Nigeria is the Yoruba tribe in the southwestern part of Nigeria to be precise. I moderately play a few musical instruments, you know, the piano, the acoustic guitar and the recorder. And that is me playing at a, a, a church event in Bradford, West Yorkshire, a couple of years back. Next slide, please. Um, other things that um, I feel you should know about me is um, the fact that I started teaching and tutoring pupils and students in mathematics at a very early age. And I still do that too today. I enjoy watching historical and investigative documentaries. I also happen to be a storyteller and I've been lucky enough to have published some of my stories um, in the form of um, African philosophical fiction books. Um, I have um, three of them uh, published at the moment. Um, there is a picture of one, um, Naked Truth, and you can see me there reading um, a part of Naked Truth as part of the Read the World, which was a joint initiative by the IPA and the WHO alongside UNICEF um, during the global pandemic in 2020. So I have a sustained passion for, for these things, yeah, teaching mathematics, um, storytelling, and of course, writing as well. Next slide, please. Uh, presently, professionally, I, I am a chartered engineer and I have over 10 years of professional working experience. I'm a fellow of the Higher Education Academy. I'm a senior member of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. I'm also a member of the Institution of Engineering and Technology in the UK. I happen to be a corporate member of the Nigerian Society of Engineers. And I'm also a registered electrical engineer with the Council for the Regulation of Engineering in Nigeria. So these are the things I feel you should know about me professionally. Next slide, please. Um, an interesting fact is I've just been made a senior lecturer here at Wrexham Glinda University. Um, it's more or less the same job, but um, with a bit of additional responsibility. So primarily what I do as a lecturer is I teach um, and supervise undergraduate and postgraduate students uh, within the Faculty of Art, Science and Technology here at um, Wrexham Glinda University. Expectedly in my role, um, I'm required to have a lot of skills in terms of interpersonal communications and also um, establishing good working and professional relationships between the students and also uh, and between member of staff that I work with. Um, that's a, a, a screenshot of me speaking recently on the staff values here at um, Wrexham Glinda University. So this was part of a project that um, another colleague worked on. And if you Google that, you should be able to find that video on YouTube. Uh, next slide, please. Now, at the moment, my research cuts across a number of specialized areas. Um, primarily it borders on the application of artificial intelligence in the area of um, sentences and optimization. So focusing on antennas, networks, devices and systems. Um, expectedly this requires a lot of teamwork because I do not work alone. 
I work alongside with colleagues at the University of Glasgow, uh, Queen Mary University uh, in London, um, Liverpool, um, even outside of the UK. So it involves a lot of persons, you know, trying to to meet stated aims and objectives. Um, here is a visualization of what I would say um, I normally do um, uh, on a weekly basis. So you have uh, an antenna there. Uh, the model is on the left. Um, if you're looking at the screen, and uh, you have the the, the 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 response of the antenna on the right, and the optimization process using AI techniques is to adjust the topology of this structure until we have uh, the desired response. And once we have the desired response, we could take the model and just prototype it, as you can see in the image on the far left of the screen. So you have the, the finished product there. And this is primarily what my research entails. And of course, I still do a lot of work in the area of mathematical modeling, uh, machine learning, uh, mathematical analysis, uh, model-based design, and digital and imaging technologies. But I feel it's good that you have a feel of what my primary research is, and that is why you have this animation or this visualization of what I do here. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in terms of my career path, I've been lucky enough to have worked in different organizations across various roles in the last uh, couple of years, about 10 years or more to be precise. Uh, prior to, to, to joining Rex and Glendale University in 2016-2017, uh, where I was studying towards a PhD and I was at the same time a sessional lecturer. I was a research fellow um, via industrial attachment uh, with the Center for Satellite Technology Development in, in Nigeria. And at the same time, I was also a visiting research and technical assistant to, to the center director of the RFID Research and Development Center also in Nigeria. So my position at the RFID Research and Development Center was a secondment from um, the National Space Research and Development Agency. And my main uh, role uh, was to undertake um, advanced field work, investigating uh, the possibilities of um, applying RFID technologies for the remote monitoring of assets and facilities in Nigeria. Um, as expected, um, I required, I was required rather to to undertake a lot of critical thinking, a lot of you know, critical analysis as well. Yeah, coming up with um, white papers, uh, proposing solutions, proposing architectures for for the best way to to go about this. And you can see a picture of myself and um, uh, other members of the Nigerian delegation to the RFID Journal Life a couple of years ago. Um, this was uh, part of some of the things we had to undertake yeah, to meet with um, prospective international collaborators to see how we can extend the use and applications of RFID technologies in Nigeria. And on the right there, you can see a system block diagram just visualizing um, uh, uh, an asset that, is, uh, that you have a, a tag affixed to, that is an RFID tag. And you have some of the services that we expect this tag to, to provide in terms of um, the monitoring and also the, 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 the tracking, uh, track and trace of the asset. Uh, next slide, please. And um, prior to that, I was a project and research assistant uh, during my uh, MSc studies at the University of Bradford. I happen to be within the radio frequency antennas, propagation and computation and electromagnetics research group. You are working directly under Professor Rahid Hathalamid, who also supervised my MSc uh, dissertation. He was also one of the secondary supervisors for my PhD. And the main uh, area that I focused on at this time was the design and optimization of novel quadrifiler helical antennas in wireless communication applications and using uh, computational intelligence techniques, particularly evolutionary algorithms, genetic algorithms. And the applications we were looking at then uh, were also RFID and um, 
uh, GPS, L band and S band. I won't go into the technical details. And you have an image there of one of the um, antennas that I was able to conceptualize. And during my MSc, it's a novel design in the sense that um, there is no or there was no uh, quadrifilar helico antenna at the time that had this sort of topology. So I was able to achieve this by shifting the, the, uh, the, the, the helico elements, four of them, uh, in phase to, to, able to, to, to achieve this during my MS, it was quite challenging um, because I used uh, a 200 page Fortran code. Yeah, you wouldn't be using Fortran code anymore. So it's mainly Python, uh, MATLAB, and, so, yeah, and some other modern languages that you now use for programming and engineering. Uh, but I, I used a 200 page Fortran code uh, to achieve this, mainly because the, the electromagnetic code that was used to generate the design was written many years ago and the Lawrence Livermore uh, Laboratory in the US. So that was what we had at the time, and that was what I had to make do it. So occasionally, uh, when you become an engineer, you will realize that you still need to make use of legacy systems and also legacy codes. And depending on the, the nature of the job and the task you've been given to, to accomplish. So um, you need to bear that in mind as well. Uh, next slide, please. And prior to that, um, I was a technical assistant as well uh, to the director and head of department of the largest public electrical engineering uh, service uh, department in Nigeria, the Electrical and Street Lighting Services Department of the Federal Minister of Works headquarters. Um, in this capacity, I was mainly involved in computer-aided design and drafting uh, using a software called AutoCAD by Autodesk. Um, the, the, the rationale for doing this was to support the implementation of electric and street lighting services to have um, better documentation, to have um, clarity in terms of what should be done before moving to the site. And you can see some of the schematics that I designed uh, many years ago now, um, showing street light installations where you have the, the Marshalling kiosk and some other things that are detailed in the schematic as well. You can see the poles, you can see the lamps. Um, it just gives you a good visualization and an idea of what goes where and what needs to be done. And also the number of um, lighting points, the number of units, the spacing that should be there, um, the, 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 the details about the wiring and the cables, also the specifications for, for the transformer to be used and so on and so forth. Next slide, please. And at the same time, I was also a technical art and project manager to the president of the Association of Illumination Professionals. So as at the time, I was with the Federal Ministry of Works, and the director that I was the technical assistant to was also the president of this association in Nigeria. And as a young graduate fresh out of school and um, I was given this I will call it a mammoth task um, because um, I haven't done this before so I was given the responsibility to to manage the timely scripting design printing and publication of the maiden edition of the technical magazine of the organization or the society so I was responsible for applying for the ISSN, that's the international serial number for, for the magazine. I was responsible for collecting all the technical articles, editing them, arranging them. And um, it was quite a challenge, but it was also very interesting uh, because I was fresh out of school and I was managing my first technical project on the job. And of course, I had the support and also the mentorship of my director and also some of the deputy directors then so it was it was a bit of fun and also a bit of challenge at the time and you can see the the front and the back pages of the magazine that was published many years ago now uh, next slide please now before i finished uh, my undergraduate degree um, i was also fortunate to undergo some sort of industrial training as a part of my degree, Howard, 
I understand that also takes place here in the UK, particularly if you're starting towards an M eng and not a B eng. So you have some time of to, to go and gain some industrial experience. It wasn't one year because I know in the UK it's usually a year, so it was six months. And I was an industrial trainee um, and an apprentice at the transmission company of Nigeria. So I worked at a power substation, a 330 uh, kilovolts power substation. And um, I was mainly involved in things like um, a system control, uh, protection, uh, metering, um, troubleshooting, going to the switchyard for, for routine checks and filling in operational forms. Uh, checking that things were okay, uh, answering and responding to one-way radio communications, um, a lot of things, a lot of things. So it was a whole package for me. So there was also electrical maintainers as well. I was also involved in the commissioning of uh, a, a, a transform. I can remember the capacity now because it's been many years. And based on this experience and coupled with other things that I was involved in at the time, I worked on a project that had to do with the uh, wireless uh, monitoring and control of a portable um, gasoline generator. Um, obviously, what I did can also be extrapolated to, to, to bigger generators. And um, I primarily reverse engineered the electronic control mode of a car alarm system. And I used that to to, 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 to start a generator and also to, to turn it off remotely whilst checking and monitoring the, the fuel level. And any time the fuel level was um, below a certain um, value or a certain level, then it gave off a blaring alarm that, that needs to, to, to be filled again. And that was my undergraduate project. It was quite interesting. I'm quite proud of that um, because that was my first Anson project that I worked on almost independently because I still had a project supervisor and there was another colleague of mine who worked on this project with me so there was two of us as of then. Uh, next slide please. Now what I would say to you if you are thinking about the future of engineering and this is projecting into um, five years from now, ten years from now, probably going up to 15 years from now, uh, I strongly believe the focus will be on uh, digital and emerging technologies. Um, as you can see already, so autonomous systems uh, such as uh, driverless cars and um, uh, data-driven generative design. So um, you do not really have to be involved in the design process. Uh, all you need to do is to feed an algorithm. And an algorithm will come up with a concept for you. We come up with a design for you particularly for parts and uh, products design. Um, digital twins, um, including the metaverse. So there is a saying that probably in the next 20 years from now, there's going to be a digital twin for virtually everything, including human beings. So um, that is something to, to look out for as well. So complete production facilities, maybe for manufacturing, um, you're going to have a digital twin of that. And that is mainly to allow for things like um, predictive modeling, um, to allow for predictive maintenance as well. So that is something to, to look out for. That is something to look out for. Um, that is to say to you as future engineers, it's not just going to be hands-on skills. You also need to have soft skills as well. Yeah, because a lot of things will be done computationally. So you need experience in data science. Uh, you need experience in programming. You also need experience in understanding algorithmic frameworks. Um, so the future engineer is also going to be uh, a computer scientist, if I can put it to you that way. So it's going to involve these things and several other things that I've not listed. So in my opinion, you know, the future of engineering will mainly be in the area of digital and emerging technologies, mainly to assist what we have in place or to even replace them in its entirety. Next slide, please. Now, if you're thinking of working on a first project, you know, to get into that engineering circle, so to speak, um, I would recommend um, um, getting certain kits, or there could be several others, but I'll recommend um, the Wilson Hey Do-It-Yourself um, Artificial Intelligence Self-Driving Car. 
So you can assemble this yourself. You can also program it to do whatever task that you want the car to perform. And this will help you to start to have an idea about programming, about algorithms, and about autonomous systems, also about embedded systems, mechatronics, and robotics. So it, it's, it's, though it's a very small kit. I think it costs probably about 80 pounds now. Yeah, it gives you a very good idea of some of the areas you should be looking at, uh, particularly now and also for the future. So if you're thinking of a first project, that is an idea. Next slide, please. Now, another one that you could work on is to get the Arduino starter kit. And this one even gives you 15 electronic design projects, mainly in the area of embedded systems. So if you're looking at um, alarm systems, and um, display systems, what have you, you've got it all in this pack. And there is also a book that comes with a starter kit. And you can do all of this by yourself. All you need is a computer that works well. Uh, download the Arduino IDE. Um, the breadboard comes with it. You have jumper wires. You have all of the components that you need inside of this kit. And the last time I checked, I reckon this is also about 80 pounds, if I am correct, or 80 euros. I can't remember the exact figure now. Yeah, so yeah, get this as well and play around with it. Try all the 15 projects and you should become conversant with embedded systems once you have successfully implemented all of these projects. And because you are using the Arduino Uno board, just go online if you have any questions, go to the Arduino reference. You can Google that. You can even type up your queries and you have other designers respond to, to whatever concerns that you may have. And it's quite fun to do. It's quite fun to do. And I will recommend this as well. Next slide, please. Yeah, another idea is to um, get the Spencer Do-It-Yourself Voice Assistant Kit. And this will also help you in the area of programming, um, understanding electronic components, and soldering, what have you. So it, it's a full package as well. It's a full package, and it helps you to, to get hands on. It helps you to get hands on. So I would recommend this as well if you're considering working on your first project. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of having your first set of certifications, preparing you, you know, from transitioning from college to, to university, um, I'm going to suggest that you get onto the MathWorks website, create an account, register, and complete as many on-ramp courses as you can. Yes, yeah, start off with the basic one that introduces you to the MATLAB environment. That's the MATLAB on-ramp, where you have a very good feel of engineering and scientific programming. Then move on to Simulink on-ramp that helps you with mathematical modeling and model-based design. So if you've done a bit of calculus, if you've done a bit of um, ordinary differential equations, um, integration and the rest, Simulink will show you how you can model all of this um, using uh, uh, um, 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 design blocks. Get into circuit simulation on ramp as well, where you are able to simulate electric and electronic circuits. Uh, Simscape as well for multi-domain engineering simulations. And this helps you to understand the interplay between electrical engineering components and also uh, Uh, electrical engineering components and also mechanical components. Take, for instance, if you're going to create a model of a hydro power plant, clearly you have an interplay of mechanical engineering and electrical engineering. So Simscape is a very good environment that allows you to, to do that. Uh, another bit yeah, you can do is machine learning. Um, of course, that introduces you to artificial intelligence. Deep learning as well introduces you to artificial intelligence. Reinforcement learning introduces you to artificial intelligence. And there are several others, control system, data analysis, data visualization. So just get into it, you know, do as much as you can to have this broad base of knowledge. So when you get into the university, in a way you have an idea of what you want to do. 
what you want to achieve. And probably you may even have an idea of what your um, final year project should be like and what your career path should be like. And because the more things you try, uh, the more you're able to understand um, what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are, and particularly the things that you're interested in, the things that you are passionate about. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mohan. That was really, really great um, overview of not only your career, but all of the different ways and types of engineering that you can get involved with. And I'm sure our students watching will be very interested to take some of those resources further. Um, I have a few questions for you, um, okay. just to explain a little bit more. So, great to hear you told us a lot about your, your path, but what did you study before university and what skills did that give you that helped you get to where you are today? Um, before university, I mainly studied physical sciences, yeah, so subjects like mathematics, for the mathematics, physics, chemistry and a bit of biology. Um, I would say uh, my studying for the mathematics and mathematics and physics were the main subjects that propelled me to be where I am today, uh, mainly physics and of course mathematics and physics go hand in hand. Yes, so that's what I would say, yeah, physics and mathematics, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Um, second question, so you've worked a little bit in a sort of industrial setting, so how does the work of a uh, work and research of an academic differ from someone that works in industry? Clearly there is an interplay between the two and I would say the primary difference is this. Um, in the academia, um, the work that we do um, in terms of research, so sometimes we are targeting publications, so we just want our colleagues all over the world to review our work and say, well, this is good, yeah, this is new, yeah, it will contribute to the body of knowledge and we publish that. On the other hand, we also have industrial collaborators yeah, who do not necessarily have the resources to undertake research or to um, employ an expert, you know, to investigate a problem for them and come up with a solution. So that is something that we do continuously and persistently in the academia. So it's just much more convenient for um, probably, let me say, medium scale or small scale enterprises yet to um, liaise or form some sort of collaboration with universities to address industrial problems. And I think in the UK, one avenue to do that is what we call knowledge transfer partnerships. Yeah, so where you have the industry collaborating with those in the academia to address industrial problems. And it's not usually the case for very big companies that have their own research and development, you know, um, units and departments where they just pump a lot of money into research and development. Now to answer the question directly, I will still say because uh, the principles of engineering does not change, you know, whether you're in the industry or whether you're in the academia. So as an engineer, um, the professional standard stays the same, you're applying the same principles, the only challenge is this, the dissemination of knowledge could be different. So as a lecturer, the way I'm going to teach my students will be different if I'm in the industry and I have, a, I have an apprentice working under me. So in the industry, I'm going to focus more on demonstration. I'm going to focus more on yeah, and, um, learning by doing yeah, compared to, to the university where it's mostly um, you learn by teaching. And you learn by, okay, you need to investigate this, you need to try this in the lab. Yeah, so it's going to be more demonstrations in the industry, whereas in the university setting it's going to be more teaching alongside some demonstrations. Very great, very great answer there. And last but not least, um, what is the best piece of advice you received during your career? Uh, to be honest, I would say I've received a lot, um, but if I'm going to be a bit sentimental, um, I'm going to express this in the form of an idiom. Um, I think one of the best things that I've been told is uh, do not reinvent the wheel, yeah, but you can make it to spin faster. Yeah, so, so um, that is something that I've always uh, looked out for, particularly if you're aiming for novelty. 
Now, Nobel T could be in two fold, as Isaac Asimov said. So it's either you want to come up with a new scientific principle or engineering principle. If you're extremely clever, of course you can do that. That is novelty. Novelty could also be finding new applications for existing methodologies, existing principles. And that is something that I've leaned more towards. So I try to look at conventional methods, you know, conventional principles and think, oh, what new application can we have for this? So I would say that's the best advice that I've received. Yeah, do not reinvent the wheel, but see if you can make it spin faster. Really, really fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you again, more for such a great overview of your career so far, um, engineering and those fantastic answers. Thank you for um, having me. Thank you. Just a reminder to those that are watching, all the resources that have been shared during the talk um, will be available in the video description. So please do take the time to explore them, especially those kits if you want to get started with the world of engineering. And also please take the time to look at the other videos in this webinar series. Thanks again, Mark. Thank you, Jack. Thank you.